Well, good morning, Vintage Church. How you guys doing this morning? We're doing all right? Man, it is good to see you, and fall is in the air. How many of you guys love colder weather? Come on. I know we love it late. I know some of you, you don't, but every man in here that's really a man, we absolutely love the winter. Come on. No shave November. If my wife would put up with it, I would do it. In a heartbeat, super glad that you're here. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time or the first time in a while, my name's Stephen, I'm the pastor here, and we are continuing a series through the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, where together we're learning from the story of Nehemiah, his, his situation, his circumstances as an exile in a foreign place, God gives him a burden, we talked about that last week, to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. I want to encourage you as we continue into week three, and you missed any of these weeks, we are going through his story in order. And here's what I want to tell you. I don't know if you know this, but you can get a Bible and you can open it up on your own. Did you know that? Did you know you don't actually need a preacher to preach this story to you? I do believe you need the church to be able to hear everything together. Our faith is built. But I want to encourage you in this story. There are so many details that I'm not able to get to in just 35 minutes uh, on a weekend. I want to encourage you. There's so many things I believe God wants to speak to us today. Because Nehemiah's story, all those thousands of years ago, is the same story that we're in today. This book is not just a book of facts and history. It is an eternal book. It's not just about what happened, but it's about what always happens. And although I'm going to do a little bit of a recap to help get you caught up, I want to encourage you, if you have gotten behind or you haven't cracked open your Bible, uh, you can go to the front and you can see where Nehemiah is, find it and read his story. I believe God wants to speak to you and to us as a spiritual family. Week one, we talked about the remnant. In other words, how in the world did the people of God find themselves in such a horrible situation? You know, I covered 1,600 years of church history in week one, going all the way from the family of Abraham through Joseph, through Moses, all the way through the three kings of, of uh, Israel, the united Israel, to this situation where they are exiled 70 years into a place called Babylon. We talked about how we got there. And this is so important because a lot of times we read a story or we even consider our own story or where we may be in our life. All right, in our family, in our workplace, we tend to overweight moments instead of steps. Let me, let me illustrate this time. We seem, we seem to think, okay, I got here because of this situation. I got here because of this person. I got here because this person didn't do what they should have done. And yet, if you're really being honest, and that's what's so powerful with the Bible, the Bible's so honest. The highs and lows, ups and downs, the successes and the failures of people are laid bare so you and I can learn from them. When we humble ourselves and we look back on our story, do you know what we realize? We realize that the reason we got there is probably the result of hundreds of steps. That's how it works. It's how the devil actually fights you. It's also, incidentally, how God grows you. The devil gets you to take steps away from God, away from his truth, away from his word, Whereas God says, take steps towards me and I'll give you life, not just eternal life, but the best possible life you can have today. The closer you are to God, the more you're living under his word, the more blessed you will be. And this is the pattern we see in scripture. The children of Israel, if you've ever read their stories, but you think to yourself, wouldn't they learn already? Have you ever read the Bible and thought, golly, how do you not see this? And then you stop for a minute and you realize, oh my gosh, their story is my story too. There are things that we don't see that God wants to reveal to us about how to behave, how to act, how to grow, that we're stubborn just like they are. We learned how they got there, but we also learned that no matter how dark it got, God always preserves a remnant. God doesn't need everybody. He just needs somebody committed to his word, committed to the truth to do the right thing. Thing. Week two, we, we zoomed in and talked specifically about Nehemiah's background. Nehemiah wasn't a first generation slave. He was a second generation slave. He would have been born in Babylon. It would have been his family that would have been taken from their homes in Jerusalem, right? As the temple was being destroyed, the walls were being torn down. It would have been his parents that experienced that. He, but they would have remained committed even in a foreign land. Let me just tell you something about Nehemiah's parents. I just want to say this. Nehemiah's parents did not give the responsibility of educating Nehemiah to Nebuchadnezzar. 
He did not give it to the government. Can I just tell you, the number one responsibility of a parent is to train them up in the way they should go so that when they're older, they will not depart from it. Nehemiah is a testimony of that. As a matter of fact, God blesses Nehemiah even in this pagan nation. God blesses him. Uh, uh, he, he begins to raise up through the ranks and he becomes the cupbearer to the most powerful man in the ancient world. He was blessed. You know why? Because he lived his life God's way. Last week we learned, though, that God doesn't bless you so that you can rest on your blessed assurance. Come on. He blesses you to be a blessing. Nehemiah was in the palace. He had everything he could possibly want. Right? He was a trusted advisor to the king. He was blessed and highly favored. But then God brought a report from Israel back from his kinsmen. And the word of God says that Nehemiah received a burden from God in his place of blessed, right? God reminded him of the people who weren't. God reminded him of the condition of his homeland. He had grown up hearing the stories from his parents about what had happened. He had heard the rumblings of people starting to move back to resettle it. But then a report comes and he thinks everything's going good and it's horrible news. The walls are torn down. The people are helpless. They're harassed. And it literally breaks him. You know, he could have said, oh, you know what, I'll, I'll pray for you. Let them know I'm praying for you. You know? Prayer's powerful. But it's not if it doesn't move you. You know, prayer changes you before it change, changes things. Nehemiah went to God with this burden. And God revealed to Nehemiah what he was supposed to do. We learned last week, it's so powerful, right? He's next to the most powerful man in the ancient world at the time. And this king realizes that his advisor is kind of different. Something's off. You ever been around someone that has a burden? It's like they're kind of off. People kind of wonder why I'm so intense about stuff. So I walk around with a burden. Come on. Sometimes with my kids because they're not listening. Anybody? Come on, anybody? <laughs> you can tell when you have a burden. It's very dangerous, but the king trusted Nehemiah and asked him. Nehemiah wasn't pouting, but he could tell something was off. And he said, Nehemiah, what's wrong? Nehemiah told him what was wrong. And then the king said this. How can I help you? It's interesting. It's when God gives you a burden. Did you know it's your job to investigate? God gave Nehemiah a burden. He knew the news. But as he began to pray, God gave Nehemiah a plan before the help would come. He didn't know how it was going to happen, but God began to speak to Nehemiah and gave him an answer. Because I know, because when the king asked, guess who was ready? Well, actually, king, we need a lot because the work is great. Is there anything I can do for you? Somebody asked you that, that thing you've been wrestling with, that situation, that circumstance you don't have an answer for. If the answer showed up, right? If the person who could make it right appeared and asked you, what can I do to help? Would you know? Would you have thought about it? You see, that's what happens with a burden. First, God uses a remnant, a small group of people. He doesn't have to be a large group. He uses a remnant. Then he gives those people a burden, a burden. And as we're going to see today, that burden moves to work. Everyone say work. Man, nobody's amen in me. Nobody's shouting me down. You would have thought I just said a four-letter word. I did. But this was one that came before sin. I want to ask you this question. We're going to shift. We're going to talk about this great work. God comes through for Nehemiah, gives a burden. The king gives him everything that he needs. But now he's on the ground. And the work has to start. What do you hear when you hear the word work? Work predated sin. God gave Adam work before he gave him Eve. That's very important, ladies. Does the guy you're looking at love Jesus and have a job? If he doesn't, say bye-bye. <laughs> Adam needed to work out some stuff, needed to learn. And then in his work, God said, it is not good that that brother's alone. Come on. And he brought him a helpmate. You see, I teach our staff this principle. This is a biblical principle I learned years ago. My pastor helped me with this. You see, a lot of us, we don't know how to rest because we don't know how to work. We know how to have leisure, you know, when you plan a vacation, you know, pay all that money, get all the kids in the car, get on there, get to the vacation, get everything set up, take a couple pictures on your iPhone, post them on social media, can't wait to get home. You get all the way home and then you need a vacation from your... That's not how God designed you to work. God didn't design you to work for a vacation. God designed you to work from Sabbath to Sabbath. 
there's a cycle to Sabbath. Which came first, rest or work? Work. Most people can't rest because they don't know how to work. The Bible says the biblical work day, a work week, is sun up to sundown, Monday through Saturday. Then on the seventh day, you rest. You spend time with spiritual family. You do something that doesn't just benefit you. Right? You pour into others. It's interesting, isn't it? Many of us, we don't know work. I tell our team all the time, do you know why you can't rest? Because you can't, you're not working right. I'm sorry, but like that two-hour nap at two isn't going isn't gonna to cut it. That's going to show up right when, you're, right when you're trying to rest. All the stuff you left undone comes back. God worked on six days, and on the seventh, he rested. Six is the number of man. We're supposed to work. We have to do our part. You see, here's the thing with work. Most people want, how many of you, by a show of hands, you want God to do something incredible in your life? It will require your participation in the form of this four-letter word, W-O-R-K. Your ability to roll up your sleeves and to actually work is going to be the difference between you being blessed or not. It's going to be the difference between God coming through for you. See, we want God to work in our life without our participation, but that's not what the Bible teaches us. Every one of the miracles, without exception, God says, you do something. You want that red seed apart? Moses, put out your hand. There were several things he told Moses to do with the people before then as well. There was a great need. People needed to be fed. What's the first thing they needed to do? What do we have? Then set everyone down in groups of 50. What is that? That is work. Jesus, send them home. They're a hassle. They're complaining. They're getting hangry. We're getting kind of hangry. Make them go to their own house and take care of their own problems. And Jesus looks at them and says, you give them food. Whew. How many of you by a show of hands now still want God to do something great in your life? It's going to require you putting your hand to the plow. This is what we see this week as we talk about the work. I believe God's got a great work for you. God's got a great work for us as we go into the second year of expanding our locations and moving forward. I believe God wants to speak not just to you where you are at your work, with your family, in your life, but also where the body of Christ is as we go into the next season of ministry. Here's what I know. Because of somebody else's work, you're able to sit in here today. Did you know this used to be a nightclub? The dance floor was right there. We, early days, we pre-recorded a whole campaign video when this was like a club. You can kind of see it in this closet over here. I wouldn't look. It's ugly. But we kept it there just to remember where we came from. The big dance floor was here. It was the most expensive thing in the whole building, if you know what I'm saying. I remember we recorded a campaign video, and I noticed everyone was like really attuned to it. I'm like, man, I did a really, really good job. I noticed specifically all the men were leaning forward and looking at it. And I thought, wow, man, I'm really going to get men. By the way, great church, man, starts with strong men. And then I realized it was because there was a Budweiser centerfold right behind me the entire time. Come on, somebody. <laughs> there are people who sacrifice to make this club a church. Now we're sacrificing. We launched Belton in 2021. Everyone thought we were crazy. You know what I know about God? When everyone else says no, the one who says yes is the one he blesses. So I didn't know how we were going to pay for it, how we are going to do it, but I stepped forward, and guess what happened? God brought everybody and everything that we needed. Same thing with Liberty Hill in 2022. I thought it was going to get better politically, socially. Oh, my gosh, no. I don't know if you all remember 2022. <laughs> it was even worse. God said, you're going to launch a church in Liberty Hill. Here's your pastor. Step out and move forward. I needed Pastor Nate to do other things for us, okay? But God said, go do it. Guess what? You step out and you do it. This is where Nehemiah was in his story in the work. God gives you a burden. That burden moves you. The burden has to move you or it's not a real burden. So what's some characteristics of the burden that we see in Nehemiah? Again, I want to encourage you, read it on your own. It's powerful. But I'm going to pull out some things that I think can apply to your life and to our future as a church. The first one is this, a unified effort. Did you know it takes unity to do anything great for God? That's why our culture is being destroyed. We don't celebrate unity, what unites us, the values that make this nation great. Instead, we emphasize diversity. Do you know what the root word for division is? Divide. Why are we divided? Why? Because we're focusing on things we can't change, we don't have control of. Did you know that God makes us diverse? We didn't do anything to earn that. How many of you picked your mom and dad? I mean, really. I mean, you picked what nation you were going to be born in. You didn't pick. God knew you from the foundation of the earth, gave you your uniqueness. It's not our uniqueness that we have to fight for. It's our unity that we have to fight for. Are we going to put this first in our life? 
That's what unites us, by the way. That's why all the rules in the church are different. That's why we don't, we don't see you through the color of your skin or through how much money you have or don't have. We don't see you from what side of the tracks you're on or what stage you're at in your life. Remember Paul talking to young Timothy raised by his grandma, lacked a father figure? He said, be an example to everyone else of who a leader is supposed to be in the church. You know, this book, is, it's actually not full of, it's full of answers. It's not full of excuses. It's powerful. Think about this for a minute. A unified effort. Nehemiah 4, 6, at last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city. For the people had worked with enthusiasm. Isn't this powerful? Half, half of success is having a good attitude. Are you an American or an American? You have to choose. I'm going to be unified. You know what? I didn't like how they talked to me, okay? But you know what? I talked to somebody like that the other day, so I'm going to get over it. I'm going to put the mission first. This is why we do membership university. We just want everyone to know up front, these are the things we are not moving on, so help us God because they're solid in Scripture. This is what the mission of the church is because you know everybody has an idea of what we should be doing. We have to go back to what God says the church's purpose is. Right? What are the values that unite us? How do we make decisions? That's what we have to, you know, you have to fight for unity. You get diversity for free. You have to fight for unity. That's what's wrong with our world today. Next, there's diligence and commitment. Okay, attitude gets you halfway there, but how many of you know a halfway wall is as good as no wall? It'll get you halfway there, but what happens when you get to Wednesday, which we call hump day, and you don't want to get up? You're going to have to have some diligence, some stick to I couldn't spell that, so I didn't put it in there. <laughs> some commitment to what God's called you to do. Lord, we're going to go late. Nehemiah 4.21. We worked early and late from sunrise to sunset, and half the men were always on guard. Biblical work week, sun up to sundown, six days a week. You're thinking, man, I need more rest. Nope. If you're working like that, you might need more rest. Think about it for a minute. The European work week is not a thing, certainly not a biblical one. Work is where we find meaning, where we get connected. Do you know why? I, if somebody gave me $10 million today, I'd put it in the bank and not tell you anything about it, and I'd still ask you to roll up your sleeves and join me in this work. It's not about one person doing things. Here's what happens when we all do our part. We're built up in it. It's not just that church on the corner that used to be a club. It's my church. I'm a part of it. I have relationships there. I'm committed to it. I'm unified in it. So important. Overcoming obstacles, that's the next thing. We're united. We have diligence and commitment. But we're going to come with some obstacles. We're going to talk about overcoming adversity and opposition next week. But anything great God wants to do in your life, you better be ready for a fight. You know what was wrong with the children of Israel while they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years? They wanted the promised land without the fight. You don't get the promised land without the fight. There's always a fight. Can't we all just be nice? Can't we all just be in unity? Yeah, around God's word. And you know what that's going to do? That's going to put us divided against the world. Every single time. They hated Jesus. Who are they also going to hate? Jesus promised that. Like it's in the book, in red. In the gospels. It came from his mouth. He said, don't be surprised. I've overcome all of it though. If you stick to my word, there's nothing I can't use you to do. But you will face obstacles. Nehemiah 4, 14, this is his response. Then as I looked over the situation, it was not good. I called together the nobles and the rest of the people, and I said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. What's the purpose of church? What's the purpose in gathering together? Faith. Where there is faith, there cannot be fear. God says, do not fear, 366 times in the Bible. That's one each day and for leap year. I knew it. Every single day with an extra. You know why? We need to hear that. You know why? Because we're going to be tempted to be silenced. We're going to be tempted to be cowards. That's our state without Christ. But he says, remember the Lord who is great, glorious, and fight. Everyone say fight. fight. Can't we just get along, guys? Oh, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't know about you, but when I've grown the most, somebody hurt my feelings. Because I had to change the way I thought about something. I had to change the way I was acting. I had to do something different with my life. Nothing great comes without opposition. 
fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. I'm gonna give you something that's really, really clear in scripture. Throughout scripture, we see this pattern. Your first responsibility is to God and to God alone. That centers every other relationship in your life. Your next one is your family. You're not responsible for everything. You're responsible for the thing God's put in your hands. You're responsible for your job, how you act, who you are. You're, you're responsible to protect your family, men. That's your job. Stop worrying about all the conspiracy theories online. It is interesting, though. Because <laughs> most of them, they don't stay theories very long. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> What's more important? Get your butt up, put your boots on, go work for your family. That's what you're supposed to do. That's where you find fulfillment. You don't find fulfillment staying up all night looking at porn. You don't find fulfillment going to the club with your buddies. And if you do, you're a boy, not a man. A man has to grow up and move on. You're responsible for your family. Wives, you too. You too. You have some responsibilities. I won't draw any pictures, but I think you know what they are. He doesn't earn that. You guys are one. You're a partnership. It's important. Facing opposition. Working is unto Christ. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. If God's in the work, we have to depend on him. Next is dependence on God. This is huge. You have to depend on God. That great thing, you're not going to get there on your own. Ultimately, you can be unified. Ultimately, you can have diligence and commitment. You can overcome obstacles. But if God's in it, God has to show up. You have to make room for God. Nehemiah 4, 9. But we prayed to our guard, our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. It's both. We prayed to God. We believed. God. I love, I had over 200 people here for a prayer training yesterday. Isn't that crazy? In November on Veterans Day weekend. Let's give it up for our veterans. Come on. All of our, it's, it's Veterans Day. It's all of our active and our, yeah. Thank you. You guys came out and you said, you know what? I'm going to learn how to pray. You know, we need prayer. That's what everything great starts with God. But then we also have to pick up the tools. We have to get to work. And finally, sacrificial giving. This is a pattern we see with God. There's a sacrifice that's required. This is what it says in Nehemiah 10, 39. The people and the Levites must bring these offerings of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms and place them in the sacred containers near the ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and the singers. This is fascinating. Go back to that list. These five things that we see. Sacrificial giving. By the way, five is the number of grace. It's interesting, too, because there was lots of government money involved in this project. Lots of things were provided. But God still said, Every single one of you have to sacrifice. You know, there are three levels of giving that I walk people through as a pastor. You can't ever jump a level. You, have to, you can only go from one to another. You can't jump one. The first one is you give what you can afford. In other words, you give what costs you nothing. It's better than nothing. You give out of your excess. That's the lowest level of faith. The next one is sacrificial giving. Here's what happens. You stop paying $17 for a cup of coffee. You tighten the belt. You decide in your heart, I'm gonna set this aside and I'm gonna give this above and beyond. But you know what the highest form of giving and faith is? Stop trying to think it all through. Ask God, this is what you do. Ask God what you should do and then do what he tells you to do. Every time I've asked God, you know what's happened? He comes back and he tells me to do something that I don't have what I need to do yet. When I purpose in my heart to do it, I take a step of faith, all of a sudden, everything I have is there. God told us to start a school, so guess what we did? We started a school. We didn't know anything about a school. And it's already better than all the public ones. Come on. We figured it out. God opened doors and relationships. We started having space problems. God gave me a vision for an outdoor area. We're going to talk more about some projects here next week. Got lots of pretty pictures to show you. We didn't have any money for it. My executive pastor, where are we going to get money for that? I don't know. I just know that we need it and that God said to do it. And I know we're going to share it. And we're going to be generous. So we stepped out. We literally got uh, a two hundred and seventy-four thousand dollar donation for that. Granted, it's going to cost us about three fifty. We'll talk about that next week. <laughs> Here's my point. Here's my point. You guys are laughing. I'm talking about that next week. Here's my point. God always does what He says. He always pays for what He tells you to do. Always. It's just never on your timetable, and it requires your faith. You know, it was faith that got you in a seat. It's faith that's impacting our entire region for Christ. As a matter of fact, I have a testimony from Liberty Hill. 
I want to share with you. It's incredible what happens when we make space. Here's what I know. God always makes room for more souls, for more people. There are people all over our region just looking for the right place. We've got to make sure that we can open our arms and give it to them. Take a look at this video. It's powerful. Should I just smolder at the camera? <laughs> yeah, what is that? Um... back, we had been on the search for a church home for the first 11 years of our marriage. We moved to Austin 12 years ago, and it seemed as if we visited every church in a 20-mile radius. We attempted to get plugged in, but we never found our fit, our people, our place to plant. We had looked at each other, and we said there's one thing in common with each of these churches, and it was us. So 2020 rolls around, we move out to Liberty Hill, and we started attending a church nearby, and we committed to that house. It wasn't everything that we dreamed of, but the kids' program was open, and we were done hopping. We decided to stop wandering, stop criticizing, and to plant our feet. We knew God calls us to be planted, and we wanted the blessings that come with planting, such as community, friendship, true worship, opportunities to serve, and a chance to see the Bible so a few months into attending that church, a neighborhood friend told me that a friend of hers had just launched a church in Liberty Hill, and she thought of us right away. I Googled it, and I told Andrew that we were going to go on Sunday. Funny thing is he had just committed to leading in the other church's men's ministry. That was interesting in itself. <laughs> we walked in that next Sunday, and we realized God's goodness. This is our church. This is where we are plant and commit <laughs> to grow and love to serve and be loved. Looking back, there wasn't anything wrong with the other churches. God was saving us for the place we were meant to be. He was saving us and our commitment for vintage. I called the lead pastor at that previous church and honorably exited. We dove in headfirst at vintage, started by volunteering on Sunday mornings with Caitlin and kids and me and set up and tear down. And from there, we started a small group and continued to stay alert for voids to fill. Now Andrew leads mobile team and I lead our kids program. God took our heart and heard our cry to be planted in community. He held them tight until Vintage was ready. We are so thankful. Cheers to the future of our house. <laughs> it's pretty powerful. Come on, put our hands up. Come on, hands together. Every time we make play, space, you have no idea who's coming around. I have one thing against Andrew. He's too tall. He's just too tall. Uh, I do have a height problem. Uh, I do have a height problem, and I want to be, be taller, so he's he, always looking down on me. But anyways, anyways, <laughs> love that incredible couple, those stories. We have hundreds of them, and it's all because we step forward. And you know, as we close out service, and we're, we're, we're going to land the plane here, I want to update you on kind of where we are in the second year. We started a three-year journey last year. And man, unbelievable what God has done. But remember, we got just part of the wall built. We got to keep moving forward and keep the pressure on. So I want to share uh, really something exciting. This last year, above and beyond all of our tithes and offerings, you're going to pull that slide up. Uh, we've raised over $800,000. Come on. Come on. Over 600 of that is just our location alone. It's unbelievable what God's doing. We actually exceeded for the first time in our church's history. We always raised just what we need. We actually exceeded that need to move to, to actually break ground by nearly $60,000. Come on, one more time. Pretty powerful. We have about six and a half million dollars in projects. That's a $3.5 million need. I'm going to ask you to do a few things this next year. First of all, I want you to pray. I want you to pray. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to pray. I want you to ask God, what would he have you do? Maybe you've already done some stuff. Maybe you already did a pledge, but it was too small. I know that because you're already done. Come on, do another one. Okay, maybe, maybe it's just getting involved, you know, in, in what we're doing here as a church. Go to this next slide for me with my, my three things that I want to talk about. Them. First thing I want you to do is I want you to pray and I want you to ask God what to do. God will speak to you. If you're in this house, if you've been blessed in this place, make room for somebody else. First thing you need to do is pray. Then I want to ask you to pledge. Pledge for the next two years. We have two years left. As you can see, we still have about 1.5 million that we need pledged, that we need to come in to finish all of our projects. Here's what I know about God. God always does his part when we do ours. I'm not gonna tell you what to pledge. You need to pray and ask God, but do something. I believe that when all of us do something, we get 
where we want to go. We get where God has for us. And then finally, participate in year and giving. Next week, I'm going to bring some needs that we have between now and the end of the year to really jumpstart some different things. We purchased the building on the corner. We have several projects with the school that are also going to bless the church that I'm going to be bringing to you. And so I want you to right now be thinking three things. Number one, God, what would you have me do? Number two, we have lots of projects across all of our locations. If you haven't pledged, pledge. And then number three, begin to ask God for what you can set aside for this year-end gift so that we can push forward into the new year stronger than ever. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for the power of your word. I thank you, Father, for Nehemiah's story. Father, you build the same way you've always built through your people. And I pray, God, that you would continue to speak to us. You would continue to lead us and guide us. Wherever we are, Lord, you would clearly tell us which way we need to go. And I pray, God, that we would step out in that faith to obey you. And on the other side of that obedience, you're going to meet us there. God, I also pray for others in here. Their next step is not to join this building project. Their next step is to actually get into the family of God. They're far from you, God. I pray that they would not leave this place the way that they came in. Maybe you're in here and you're far from God. Maybe you're in here and you're far from God. Maybe at one point you followed God, but you're not following him today. Maybe you've never accepted Christ, and it's because of your own pride. The Bible says that God resists the proud. If you're in here and you're walking in pride, you can see it all over your life. You're being resisted. However, he gives grace to the humble. As I've opened up God's word, spoken eternal truths the Bible said are written on every one of our hearts as creations of God you realize that you're far from him here's the reality if you're far from God you'll never be all that you were created to be purpose fulfillment meaning apart from a relationship with God you can't get to God apart from the person of Jesus Christ his death on a cross for your sins you're not good enough for God but Jesus is he gives you his righteousness and it's more than that he not only forgives you of your sin but he also hands you a brand new life through the power of the resurrection. And his heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You're in here, you find yourself far from God. You'll never be all that you were created to be apart from a relationship with him. And it starts with a free will decision to follow him. I'm not gonna embarrass you, I'm not gonna single you out, but I do wanna pray for you as we round out and end this service. If you're in here today and you're far from God and you would want my prayer, would you just lift your hands up halfway and acknowledge that? Thank you, thank you, thank you. There's hands are going all over the room. I see you. Thank you. You can put your hand up, put it right back down. What's more important than me seeing you is God sees you right where you are. He says, if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my father. But if you won't, I won't. It's a big deal to make that decision to raise your hand. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's from Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. It's a biblical prayer. There's not magic in the words, but there is magic in the surrender power, supernatural power to change your life. I believe God's going to meet you where you are, but you've got to surrender your life to him. If you really meant it when you raised your hand about getting right with God, you're not going to leave this place the same way that you came in. I want you to say this prayer just loud enough where you can hear your own voice. As a matter of fact, there are believers who love God who are going to, in faith, pray with you this prayer all around you just to encourage you. I believe God's going to meet you right where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. We're going to give you some next steps. My advice is take those steps, grow, and become all that you were created to be in the family of God. Church, we believe in what they're doing. Let's pray this prayer all together. Let's pray, Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth, for living a perfect life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe that you are good, and I believe you're God. I believe on the third day, after you were killed on the cross, I believe you resurrected from the dead. I believe you defeated death once and for all to give me life once and for all. And so today, of my own free will, I choose to make you my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Lead me and guide me. Show me what's next. It's in your name that I pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's put our hands together. Everybody did that.